Why do people keep saying that? I mean, it, yes, it's happened in history, but how do we know for sure the price is going to go up post having again? And by the way, the price has already been going up. Okay, so there's a couple of factors. To this. The first factor is you have an asset which where the demand and acceptance is increasing. I don't think you can deny that about Bitcoin. Sure. I mean, especially now there's an ETF that's been approved. So all of a sudden, this asset that was once seen as a black market, dark web, evil asset, and this asset which was unacceptable for merchants is now seen as an acceptable asset. So the demand and acceptance of the asset is increasing. So, and, and we're in the, the early stages of the life cycle of the acceptance of Bitcoin as a store of value slash a currency slash a medium of exchange. Cryptos are once again minting millionaires overnight, not unlike what we've seen two years ago, but this is just the beginning of a new bull cycle unlike anything we've seen before, says our next guest, Ron Neuner, host of Crypto Banter. Uh, we'll be talking about what's been going on the last couple of weeks, why everything's been blowing up the last four weeks, and what's next. Is this the market top or is this just the beginning? Well, let's find out. Uh, I Trust Capital, a shout out to our sponsor, I Trust Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1%. It also offers unique tax benefits. So if you're over 18 and you want to open a new account with cash or roll over an existing account, click on itrust.capital slash David in the link down below uh, to learn more and get started. This may be a good place to park your Bitcoin uh, returns if you're interested in parking it somewhere besides your wallet. An IRA may be the place to go. Click on the link down below to learn more if this is for you. Ron, good to see you. Welcome back. Nice to see you. I think the last time I was here, we weren't in the full raging bull, but I think I told you that we we're about to hit a raging bull. Here we are. A uh, couple of months later, Bitcoin has tripled, or almost tripled. Uh, and we're in, I would say now, in a full raging crypto bull market, which is a, a lot of fun. You know, I want to ask you why you think we're in a bull market now and we weren't when we talked last. Because we, we, we were speaking, I think, sometime around the fall, late summer. But remember, Bitcoin was already up what, 150% from the lows by then already, right? It was like thirty-five dollars or $40,000 a coin at the time. I don't remember exactly. But remember, it dropped around, what, 17000 And so that run up, people didn't, didn't consider that a rally? I mean, what, what's different now? You know, I think you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta think about markets like this. Markets fluctuate between overbought and oversold territories all the time. And the younger and the more illiquid the market, the higher the fluctuations between overbought and oversold. That's why typically when you look at crypto cycles, the highs used to be very, very high, unlike any other market in the world. And the lows were low, like, and, you know, like every, any other market in the world. Now, if we zoom back to November 2023, yeah. um, and we look at, sorry, no, um, when FTX collapsed, uh, give me one second, let me just get you the exact data. I don't, I don't want to give it to you. But when we look at the FTX collapse, we knew that that was really very, very, November very much. November 2022, you're right, 2022. 2022, that was very much the lows. By that time, the, because we had the massive capitulations, the market was oversold by a lot. And then from that point, it started to recover. And then last year, um, when BlackRock applied for the ETFs, and the exact date escapes me of when BlackRock applies for the ETF, you could say that that was a massive, massive turning point for the crypto market because that was the effectively BlackRock putting its chips down and saying, we're about to institutionalize the asset class and we're starting off with Bitcoin. And that's when I went from bull to crazy bull mode. And I think I, I think I was on your channel. I was certainly on our channel and many other channels. And I said, guys, there's a very short period of time in between the approval process where you've got an arbitrage because you know that there's a high probability that this ETF is going to get approved. Anyway, fast forward uh, a little bit. Uh, fast forward a little bit. January 11th, I think the the ETF got, gets approved. Bitcoin was at 43,000, and then we had expectations of what the inflows would be for the ETF. And at the time, and I mean, I was speaking to all the analysts on all the big media channels and you know all the insiders, and we were plotting what success would look like. And at the time, the consensus was that success would mean anything between five and 10 billion net inflow into the ETFs that would constitute the best ETF launch ever in the first three months. Anyway, fast forward two months, we're already very near to that. We're already over the five billion, I think very, very, very close, if not already at, at 10 billion. So this ETF has exceeded all expectations. Now, what's the best marketing for crypto? Prices go up. 
when prices go up, that does enough marketing for people to say, look, this Bitcoin thing is the only asset that we can invest in that can significantly um, that can significantly alter the structure of our portfolios with a small investment. Uh -huh. And so now you've got this insatiable demand for the for the ETFs. And to be honest, I mean, we've seen about call it about 10 billion that that that's flowed in. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but call it around 10 billion dollars already flowed into all, all the ETFs. This is just a beginning because remember that the big fans, the family offices, they haven't yet allocated one or two percent of their of their total portfolios into Bitcoin. So I think this is just the start of a Bitcoin bull, bull market. I think there's still a, quite a quite a way to go. Um, yeah, I mean, as I said, I think right now we're in full bull uh, market. I had this conversation with uh, somebody else the other day, but I want to get your take as well. Um, the argument that Bitcoin's demand from the ETFs now outstrips the amount of Bitcoin mined in the same time period. Basically, demand is outstripping supply, and so that's obviously good for the fundamentals. Here's my counter argument. Well, remember two years ago, or well, a year and a half ago, when ETH merged, and everyone was talking about how the supply was going to get um, uh, deflated, we're going to get uh, fewer supplies, going to get burned out from the network, and the price is going to go up. Well, it actually went down and then stayed flat. ETH didn't actually rally until recently, right? So. If you take a look at that as a president, supply demand fundamentals didn't really help it for the price. How would you challenge that? So I think, uh, you know, when people are bullish, uh, they look for metrics that uh, that um, that are bullish. OK. And I think there is some merit in what people are saying. Look, you know, there's huge demand all of a sudden and and there's very little supply coming onto the market. The reality is that the huge demand now is a little bit of an anomaly. And it's obvious because. You know, when the, when there has been no access to an asset class and all of a sudden there is access to that asset class, then, you know, it, you almost want to think about think about it as a room where there's hungry people that are that are being starved. And then you open the door and you say there's pizza available outside. So initially, everybody's going to run to get the pizza. And then once, you know, once the rush for the pizzas is finished, then what's going to happen is people are going to start consuming less pizza. So right now we've got this increased demand because people are starting to fill up their bags with Bitcoin. And we've got the supply coming out by the Bitcoin algorithm uh, coming out. And that supply is going to halve. I think globally, the halving does have a huge effect because it means that the, 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 the net supply of new Bitcoin onto the market uh, decreases or, or the, the net supply rate halves. But I think that, it, you know, to correlate that directly to the ETF is I think you know, we call that bull market hopium. It's people trying to like, wow, look, there's there's uh, so much demand and no supply. I think the demand will slightly normalize. And I think that the halving on a global factor will have uh, um, uh, 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 effect. But I don't think that, wow, all of a sudden, as soon as the halving happens in less than 30 days, all of a sudden the price is going to double or something like that. Why do people keep saying that? I mean, it, yes, it's happened in history, but how do we know for sure the price is going to go up post having again. And by the way, the price has already been going up, right? Just because it keeps continuing to rally and then all of a sudden we have a having, you can't attribute the the continuous rally to the having because it's already been going up. So I I just I just don't I for me, I help me out here. I don't know how much weight we can put on the having in terms of making a prediction. Okay, so there's a couple of factors to this. The first factor is you have an asset which where the demand and acceptance is increasing. I don't think you can deny that about Bitcoin. Sure. I mean, especially now there's an ETF that's been approved. So all of a sudden, this asset that was once seen as a black market, dark web, evil asset, um, even by the institutions, even by the likes of you know BlackRock and stuff like that, is now seen as an acceptable asset. And this asset, which was unacceptable for merchants, is now seen as an acceptable asset. So the demand and acceptance of the asset is increasing. So, and, and we're in the, the early stages of the life cycle of the acceptance of Bitcoin as a store of value slash a currency slash a medium of exchange. At the same time, you've got, so, so you've got increasing demand curve and you've got a decreasing supply curve. And when you've got a, an increasing demand curve with a decreasing supply curve, then effectively number go up. Now, there is one other element to this that needs to be probably spoken about. That is, the cost to mine Bitcoin. So remember that in order to mine Bitcoin, you need to have a machine called a miner. A miner is effectively a computer. Uh -huh. Now there is a cost to that computer and that computer can only mine a certain number of Bitcoin 
to get a return. So let's say that, let's just theoretically say that, the, that each machine mines one Bitcoin a year. Let's just say that, okay? Now, in order for that machine to cover its costs, plus the cost of electricity, plus the cost of cooling and whatever else, it needs to generate a certain amount of income. Yes. If the, if the number of Bitcoin that that machine actually earns halves, they've now got half the number of Bitcoin, but the dollar value of that machine and the dollar value of the electricity effectively remains the same. So the only way that effectively the network can continue to pump out the Bitcoin is if the price of Bitcoin goes up and you can now cover your US dollar costs. That's a very simplistic explanation of why mathematically the price would need to continue to go up. I mean, there obviously are anomalies. Like, okay. for example, if the price doesn't go up, then the Bitcoin algorithm automatically makes it easier to mine Bitcoin. But so far, if you look at what they call the hash rate, the hash rate is a chart that just goes harder and harder and harder because more people are investing more money in more machines to try and get more return mining these Bitcoin. Here's a um, argument I've heard a lot. And you know, this person, Chris Black, tweeted it. The approval of Bitcoin ETFs will inevitably turn out to be a very bad thing for Bitcoin decentralization. Okay, he's talking about convincing the world that a future untenably centralized Bitcoin fork is the real Bitcoin. Anyway, so he's saying that like, he echoes the sentiments of many, which is that this Bitcoin ETF will provide more centralization to the institution, at the institutions holding these ETFs and thus um, possibly more volatility down the line if they move. That's a very, very, very common misconception. Okay. Let's dispel the misconception right here, right now. Unlike a company where the holders of the shares have the votes. So in a company, the holders of a share of the shares have the vote. And in a company, if I own more than 50% of the, the shares in a company, I can vote to do pretty much anything, right? And that's what he's he's kind of equating it to saying, if I own a lot of Bitcoin, then I can vote to change Bitcoin, right? That's effectively what the root of his argument is. But Bitcoin doesn't work like that. The holders of Bitcoin have zero voting power as to the direction of the network or that of the rules of the network. Mm -hmm. Then you ask yourself, okay, well, if the holders of Bitcoin don't have a vote as to how to, to drive this network or the decisions of the network, who does? And the answer is the miners, the people that own the computers that process the transactions, right? They the ones that actually decide which software to run. Now, the only way to change Bitcoin is to change the software that all these miners are running to produce Bitcoin. Now, the only way to do that is to convince all these miners that the new software is better than the old software, regardless of how many Bitcoin you got. So let's bring it down to a practical example. Let's say that one day BlackRock own 90% of all the Bitcoin in circulation. They yes. own 90%. They've managed to buy my Bitcoin, your Bitcoin, everybody else's Bitcoin. Yes. There's no way that they can manipulate the miners to change the Bitcoin algorithm. But they can manipulate because, the price, can they not? But then they, if you own 90% of an asset and you manipulate the price of an asset, not, you're losing a lot. Why would you do that? There's just no okay. logical way for you to do why, why would you do that. You'd, you'd be losing money. So th that's the beauty of Bitcoin. Unlike any other equity or whatever, doesn't matter how many Bitcoin you own, you don't get to make any decisions about how the network goes at all. I, I think, I think the word decentralized is being misused here. They're not. Yeah, I think people are conflating decentralization of the network versus decentralization of of the percentage of people holding Bitcoin, right? Because once upon a time, Bitcoin was owned by many, and now the the fear is that it's going to be owned by the mo the vast majority of bitcoins will be owned by the few. Per your example, ninety percent of bitcoins who owned cares? by BlackRock, who, right? Who cares? Who cares? So if BlackRock owned ninety percent, who cares? They can't vote or change the network in any way. And if you can't vote or change the network, then the only thing that you want is you want the price to go up. So you would never manipulate the the, the price to go down because you own the majority of the of the equity. Right. Okay. Let's talk about what's going on recently. So Bitcoin dropped below $63,000 uh, briefly. It's now above $64,000. Uh, this market correction has brought down the entire crypto market recently. So I, I think the, the concern right now is that the, uh, the ceiling is 70000 for now. Is that uh, what you're looking at? 
or what you're seeing. So I want to I want to quickly take you to a chart. Uh, if okay. you don't mind, let me. If yeah, you please. Mind, I'll share a screen here. Yeah. Go so ahead. this is the Bitcoin. This is the Bitcoin chart. I think you can see it over here. Yes. Um, this is the the bull run that we've had, and this started in twenty uh, eighth of November, twenty twenty two. And you can see that since the beginning of this bull run, if you just quickly take some easy maths, Bitcoin's up three hundred and three hundred and thirty odd percent. Now, yes, we have had a correction. Uh, I want to bring it down to a daily time frame just to show you the daily. We've had a correction, and the correction has taken us down from broke breaking the all-time high of seventy to seventy-four thousand, all the way back. We've down twelve percent. The issue is if you look at how quickly Bitcoin ran up, in terms of correction territory, we're only back twelve days. So we're at the same price that Bitcoin first hit twelve days ago. Yeah. So, I mean, it may seem like a pretty scary correction. It's ten or twelve or nine percent or ten percent or twelve percent down. But in reality, if you look at just the last month, so if we take a month ago, um, I mean, I just let me just escape here. Let me just go back one month to say the 18th of Feb or somewhere around there, 19th of Feb. Even after this correction, Bitcoin as an asset is still up 25% in the last month. Now, you cannot have a market that continues to go up and go up parabolically with no breaks and no rests. And in fact, if you look at previous Bitcoin corrections, and I'll try and find you something over here. Um, so here are our previous Bitcoin, what we call pre-halving corrections. Now, what you can see is that this orange line is the halving. The halving is the event that's happening in 30 days that we just spoke about, where the amount of Bitcoin released by the algorithm halve. And what you can see is that normally, just about a month before the halving, we get a correction. And normally, that correction is about 38%. We're only down 9%. So I kind of believe that... Um, you know, these corrections are normal. Mm -hmm. We should, you know, you can't have a market that just goes up forever. I think corrections are very, very, very healthy in a bull market. And especially in, in the crypto bull market, which is a highly leveraged casino style market. Like yeah. we have these things called leverage perpetuals, 10x, 20x, 100x perpetuals. The entire market plays these perpetuals. And the, the amount of leverage in this market is crazy. And every now and then in a market that gets highly leveraged, you want to get rid of the leverage. And so now we're having a bit of a leverage flush out. We're having a routine correction. Bitcoin does these routine corrections all the time. And every time it does it, it's tw they, you go down 10, 20, 30, and, and even, and you know, in some cases, 35%. These corrections have actually been much less. Like in this bull market, we've had corrections of 20% and 25%. So do I think that, the bull, that it's the end of the bull market? Absolutely not. Do I think this is a healthy correction, which is flushing out some leverage? and some frothy bad behavior in the market that's been running like a crazy market for the last couple of weeks and months, I think that's probably a better exp explanation of what's going on. So people are just taking profits after Bitcoin's topped the all-time highs. Yeah, Correct. That makes sense. Well, Ron, what have people been telling you on your show or even in your personal life about their predictions and their outlook? I've heard all sorts of forecasts. Okay, Standard Chartered Bank, last year they said Bitcoin's going to reach 100000 by 2024. They've upgraded their forecast. Now it's 150,000 by the end of the year. Uh, I've heard someone on my show tell me that this having a cycle will bring Bitcoin up to 100 to 200 thousand dollars by the next 12 to 18 months. A million would be the ceiling. All sorts of things. Okay. So what are people telling you? So I think let's forget about what people are telling me and let's just actually look at, at the numbers and the stats again. Sure. I, I, I'm a stats. I'm a man of numbers. You know, if you look at, at the previous Bitcoin bull markets, and I'm going to take you back, let's go back to here, 2013. You know, uh, let, let's not go back too far back, but let's go to 2013, the 2013 bull market. Let's, in fact, that's even, I mean, the first bull market started when Bitcoin was $2 and kind of ended when Bitcoin was $1,117. But let's just for the sake of fun, skip that one. The next bull market, you could say started about here at $170 and Bitcoin went up to $20,000. I mean, that's a, that's a huge, huge, huge return. Um, then, you know, the, the next bull market, you can say the low was about 3,400 and went up to about 20,000, uh, to about 60,000. That's about a 20x return. So we're kind of saying that, you know, from bottom to top, Bitcoin usually uh, like can do anything from 100x to 20x. Let's go to the tops. The top of the previous cycle was $20,000. Sorry, the, the two cycles go was twenty thousand yes. dollars, and the next one was sixty thousand dollars. That was about a three x. I would be very, very, very surprised if we never got a three x in this cycle from the previous top. 
that would give us a number of about, you know, the last previous top was 69,000. I would be very surprised if we didn't 3X that number by the end of the cycle. Sure. So if we didn't get to between 150 and $200,000, I'd find this cycle very, very, very disappointing, especially in light of the ETFs, especially in light of the fact that we're at 70, 65,000, um, where the interest rates are probably at the highest rate that they're going to be in a long time. I mean, the Fed's just completed a tightening cycle. And, you know, I think people are listening yeah. very attentively as Jerome Powell speaks to start loosening and adding liquidity back into the market. We know that Bitcoin very much likes liquidity. It's at the, it's at the end of the liquidity scale, which means that the more liquidity, the more Bitcoin responds, the faster Bitcoin responds. So if we're at 65,000 at the beginning of a rate loosening cycle or yeah. a rate reduction cycle, I don't see any way that we don't triple in the cycle. I'd be, I'd be very disappointed if in the cycle where institutions came into Bitcoin, allocating, let you understand what this institutional entry into Bitcoin actually means. It's like you and I are going to the casino in Vegas and playing on the $100 tables. And we're having fun. We're playing on the $100 tables and it's great fun. And then we walk into the Salon Privé and the minimum bet is $10,000. You know, that's the game that the institutions are playing. So I'd be very surprised if we changed from the normal casino to the Salon Privé and Bitcoin didn't at least triple. So th my, my thesis is anything lower than $150,000 to $200,000, I'd be very disappointed with the performance of the asset. Is it reasonable then, or should we assume that volatility of Bitcoin will, re will be diminished as the asset matures as more institutions adopt. In other words, yes, it 3x the last cycle, but maybe it'll only 2x the next cycle, and then 1.5x the next cycle, and then you know what 0.5, you know, so on and so forth, right? You understand what I'm saying? So I'm looking to I'm looking for a chart that I may have here. Here it is. Uh, I'm going to quickly call it up for you. Uh, it shows you how the the asset has um, has matured. If you look at the 2017 bull market, you can see the average. Real pullback was 43, 40, 34, 40, 41 percent. Yes. And that was because the asset was very small, illiquid. Um, then tw the next cycle, the dips became minus 26, minus 32, minus 23. And so far, this cycle, probably the biggest pullback we've had is a 22 percent pullback. And so what we're seeing is that the, the pullbacks have become less aggressive in, in this market. And that kind of makes sense. You know, you can't expect the returns on a very liquid as on a very illiquid asset to be the same as the returns on a very liquid asset. And, and also I think the risk profile, you know, there's more buyers, there's much more acceptance. Uh, so I think like the days of 50% Bitcoin corrections are probably finished. Yeah. That, okay. That makes sense. Um, okay. Last time we had a bull market, uh, people trusted the system. People were excited. Everyone wanted to get in on this new exciting asset class maybe people have not heard about cryptos and bitcoin and then what happened and then ftx happened and then celsius happened and then luna collapsed so on and so forth okay do we still have the same amount of trust in the system today as in 2021 in other words yes we're in the bull market now in a bull rally are we going to see the same level of hype and interest and sentiment that we did two years ago crypto was the wild west um, which is why we got these crazy, ridiculous returns. I mean, the kind of returns that we make in crypto and made and continue to make in crypto in some places were returns that, you know, like, it's not unusual for us to make 10x in a day or sometimes 50x in a day. It's just And those are returns that you don't get in a market that's not the Wild West. The Wild West comes with high risks. Some of the risks were regulatory risks or unregulatory risks. Example, FTX, example, many others. Uh, and some of the risks were technological risks, which we took. And in 2021, in that bull market, we we had a technological collapse of one of the biggest tokens, which was called Luna. That wiped out the market. We then had a regulatory collapse because there was so much unregulated leverage in the system that the whole house of cards just landed up falling. But those days are finished. Now the market is becoming much more regulated. The players, it's becoming much harder to do bad things in crypto. It's not impossible, but it's becoming much harder. The second thing that you need to understand now is that as BlackRock and all the other ETFs buy more and more crypto, more and more of the supply of the asset is going to be held in institutional portfolios. Now, when an asset is held in an institution, and, and since Bitcoin is 
the big daddy of the market and every single token usually follows the behavior of Bitcoin, we can make an assumption that as BlackRock increase, let's put it this way. We are three months in and the ETFs own about just under 5% of all the Bitcoin in circulation. Fast forward to the end of the bull market, let's say they land up owning 15, 20, 30% of the Bitcoin in circulation. At that point, Bitcoin becomes reflexive to the market cycles. In other words, up until now, crypto has traded in its own market cycle. But now, because such a big chunk of the biggest crypto in Bitcoin, remember, Bitcoin has a 55% market share. So Bitcoin is like the big daddy in crypto. And if you think that 10, maybe 15% or maybe 20% of Bitcoin will be held in the ETFs, what you can say is that going forward, the cycles in crypto will more closely um, uh, 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 resemble the cycles in the, tradition, in, the, in the traditional markets, which will resemble liquidity cycles, et cetera. So up until now, crypto has had its own, you know, its own um, decorrelation or uncorrelation with mainstream assets. Now I think we're going to fall very much into macro investment cycles, risk on, risk off, as per traditional institutions. Uh, and it will become a much easier asset class to trade, but you won't get the, the same returns that we used to get in the past. Uh, I'm looking at... Um crypto as a search term on Google Trends worldwide and it peaked in 2021 yeah April 20 May April 2021 it is now currently at 35 on the index whereas 2021 was 100 now it's 35 so there's 35 percent of the interest that it was at the peak right now I think that goes back to my point there's less interest now even than two years ago even though the price is of Bitcoin has already breached new all-time highs, right? Can you ascribe a reason as to why this may be? Sure. Sure. Let me show you something. Let me, you know, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a man of charts. I'm a man of <laughs> okay. data. While you're pulling this up, I'm going to share a personal anecdote. I was talking to a guy, a friend of mine. He's a crypto trader. Well, he dabbles in crypto trading. He's talking to this girl he wanted to date. And then he, she asked him what he does for a living. And he says, I trade crypto. She immediately ghosts him. There's this perception. And he tells me there's this perception that people involved uh, in cryptos are just rug pullers. Still, still. Don't worry. Don't, don't worry. She'll be back. She'll be back as soon as, uh, as soon as the, as soon as the, uh, uh, the, the, the market starts to turn. So I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw some very rough lines here, just, just in the interest of time. And I'm going to take you back to the previous bull markets. Yeah, please. And you can see that the previous bull markets usually start with this halving event, which happens. You can see that the halving event kind of happens every four years. And if you plot that on a chart, that's what the chart looks like. However, the real bull market only starts just after the halving. So in this case, it would have been somewhere around here. And in this case, it would have been somewhere around here. This is when the real bull market is when the aggressive moves in crypto happen. And this is when the retail interest usually comes in. So this part here is not when the retail come in. Retail come in when they see the life-changing returns, which happens sometime just after the halving, which is somewhere around here and somewhere around here. Okay. Now, if you look at where we are in our, uh, in our chart, and I'm going to draw very similar lines, although they're not going to be as neat. Here we go. You can kind of see that we're following exactly the same pattern. And we've just broken out. So you can kind of say that that breakout is equal to that breakout, which is also equal to that breakout. The retail interest will come the, here. This is where the retail interest usually comes. And we've just, just, just got into that part of the bull market. So the good times are still ahead for us. Like the, the majority of the returns in the cycle are here. Um, they say that 80% of the returns are made in, in the last 20% of the cycle. Uh, and I think that this is the last 20% of the cycle. And we're about to get into the last 20% of the cycle where 80% of the returns are going to be made. And that's when retail is going to come in. The sad thing is that retail are going to, you know, we've been buying all along here and probably we're still buying. The sad thing is that retail are going to come in and they're going to buy all the way up here. And, you know, more and more and more retail come in as you go later, later, later. And then they're going to land up holding it all the way down at the bottom. And that just happens every single cycle. So you say the interest is not there. The interest is not there yet, but wait until we start making real returns. And when I say real returns, not just 300% returns. I'm talking about like crypto returns. 
Then the retail will come here and try and make their millions in this casino called crypto. And unfortunately, most of them will hold too long and get wrecked. Uh, back in 2021, we had just recovered from a post-pandemic era. Quantitative easing was was rampant. People had free money from stimulus checks, so on and so forth. We don't have any of that today. In fact, people are concerned about a recession. This recession that's been telegraphed for more than a year that never came. Are, are you concerned about a recession just wiping out interest in cryptos and Bitcoin and all speculative assets? No, I think that the opposite way around. I think very soon Jerome Powell is going to start reducing rates. We're in a reduction cycle. That's going to increase liquidity. More liquidity is going to mean more money in the in the economy. More money in the economy is going to mean more spending. And I think that I think that I'm very 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 bullish about uh, the worldwide uh, global economies. Yeah. Um, well, worldwide global liquidity. I'm not sure I'm, I'm bullish about econ specific economies. I'm bullish about global liquidity. And if you're glo bullish about global liquidity then you're bullish about the increase in risk asset prices. And so I think that you can already see that we're we're in a risk asset boom. You know, you got the NASDAQ at all-time highs. You got the S&P at, at all-time highs. You got crypto at all-time, or Bitcoin at all-time highs, not crypto at all-time highs. So I think I'm very, very, very bullish on, on liquidity. And remember, all this is happening at the top of an interest rate cycle. Uh, Bitcoin has captured headlines because of the ETF and the price action. I want to know if the rest of the crypto market is catching up to Bitcoin in terms of its hype and gains. Is it just Bitcoin's show right now or is all of crypto experiencing a rally? Not at all. I mean, I, I want to show you, what, this is an application actually that, that you know, we've built. It's called Banter Bubbles. Um, and I want to actually show you the bubbles. So this is the Banter Bubbles. It's a very cool application. What it does is it shows the prices of all crypto in bubbles. Okay. Oh, wow. Now, now this is, it's called banterbubbles.com. It's available on, on Android and uh, and on iOS. Now let's just look at the annual returns. By clicking on this tab here, this is the annual returns of some of our crypto. So Solana is up 724%. Uh, by the way, we're big investors in Solana. Near Protocol is up 215%. Render, which is a GPU, um, mine, a GPU mining, distributed GPU mining token is up 641%. Injective, which is another blockchain, is up 715%. Akash, which is similar to Render, is up 1,603%. This has been our year. I mean, you know, like, this is what's been happening in crypto in the last year. Let me show you the last month. So in yeah. the last month, we've had tokens up 152%, 516%, 164%. So this is a, a I mean, I use this as a great tool, but it just shows you that you know, you think the action is in Bitcoin. There is, no, it's not Bitcoin. Now, let me show you something very, very, very crazy. You see this token called WIF. So it's <laughs> WIF. Okay, so, I mean, this is a very cool token. It's, uh, yeah, I'll show it again. It's called WIF. Now, what is WIF? WIF stands for dog with hat. Okay, now, what is dog with hat? Dog with hat is a meme coin. It does nothing. It has no <laughs> use to it whatsoever. Boy, here we go again. Other than the fact that it's a meme. And the meme is around a dog with a hat. Okay? Now, this meme coin that does nothing has a market cap of $2.6 billion. Okay? Now, you ask me, does it get cash flows? Absolutely not. Does it get any kind of return? No. It's just people buying meme coins in what we call a meme coin craze that is currently happening in meme in, in crypto people are buying these coins because they want to be part of it or they think that they're part of a community and it's like it's a meme now this meme culture has become this crazy casino of crypto people you know exactly what you're getting you know when you buy it, this token does nothing it's not technology it's just a gambling token to see if anybody will buy it higher than you it's just that that's what it is Boy, i i just pulled up a chart of wif the dog with hat okay it only started yes. rallying in february so Correct. like most of the gains happened in the last month let me show you let me show you the, the price of dog and i mean you know the irony is that this 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 token this token does nothing, doesn't purport to do anything. It, it, there's no promises. Now, I just want to show you, I'm going to quickly show you. So that's the chart. Right. And you can see that this token has gone from 0, 0.06, so not even one cent. It's done a 3,800% return in the last month. The community of Dog with Hat went and raised $650,000. People just sent $650,000 to like a kind of like a GoFundMe account. And they're going to brand the Vegas Sphere 
with a dog with the, wearing a hat. And this has been driving the price of dog with hat up. Now, what is a meme coin? It is you're betting on the relevance of a meme and it's just a, Wait, it's hold a on. game. Is that, is that Photoshop or is that an actual, did they advertise that's Photoshop. on the chair? Oh, that's, that's Photoshop, okay. but they have raised the money to actually make, put the dog with the hat <laughs> on the Vegas. So now there's a whole lot of holders who believe in dog with hat. I actually want to show you something else and I, and I hope your viewers don't take any offense to this, but this meme culture is so, so big that there is a token. I mean, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these, what we call meme tokens, okay? Including a token called Elizabeth Warren. And the Warren is spelled W-H-O-R-E-N. This token has a market cap of $14 million, okay? Uh, and people, I'm, I actually, I'm, I'm a big holder of Elizabeth Warren. And the reason why I hold it is because to me, this is the official token of the crypto opposition against the, the resistance inside the US government, which is led by Elizabeth Warren. And so there is this whole meme coin culture right now. I mean, don't get us wrong. No one's under any illusions that, that this is investment. It's just a game that we play. It's like a gambling game that you're allowed to play on the blockchain by yeah. speculating as to which memes are going to become more relevant. I right think now, you, look, I would say, you even, I would say about 1% one, one, 1 of my portfolio is in these rubbish meme coins. And I do them just every time I want a bit of an adrenaline pump. But Dave, you can't discount. You can't discount the the how big memes are in in uh in communities right you can't discount how big memes are in communities i want to show you one more meme coin because i think it'll actually give you a lot of relevance i i, I just i just find it very difficult to believe that this is happening in the background and the mainstream media have pretty much all but ignored this for the last year all they've talked about okay. was mag 7. have you ever seen have you ever seen about this have you ever seen this this uh, this meme on on TikTok or on, on Twitter. Yes. It's the meme of the cat. So this is called VCAT, Vibing Cat. <laughs> Vibing Cat has a very big community, actually. Uh, I mean, the token hasn't performed well today because we're in, we're, we're in the midst of a little uh, correction. Yeah. But Vibing Cat has an $8 million fully diluted valuation and 11,600 people own this token. Mm -hmm. So look, there's a serious side of crypto, which is a technology which is changing the world. And then there's the fun part of crypto. And then the fun part of crypto is we've created a casino where people bet on the relevance of memes. You know, it's a game. It's a, it's a game of memes. People are creating the cutest, funniest, uh, most, most, let me, let me show you one or two other memes. So, you know, Andrew Tate, you know, and you know, Andrew Tate calls himself top G, you know, yeah, the, he's, yeah, a, yeah. he's the, he's the top G. Um, so a community created, a meme coin called GTOP. Uh, I don't know if you can let me see, let me show you my screen. It's called GTOP. It's a, it's a it's a it's a meme around Andrew Tate's top G. Uh, uh, and I'll actually show you. I want to go to my Twitter and I'll show you what the uh, what his you know how they meme him. This is very funny, but it's it's actually it's a yeah. So th this is how they meme him. You know they they meme him to look like that like top G. You know like the tight shirt. And, and so like, we've created this casino of people betting on cultural memes. And we know it's a game. Now, the, the cool part here is that most of these memes, most of this betting or trading of these tokens happens on a blockchain called Solana. And so Solana is a very fast, very cheap blockchain, which a lot of people think is going to overtake Ethereum and become the number two cryptocurrency. And as a result of all this meme coin, uh, all this meme coin uh, fun that people are having, yeah. if you look at the price of Solana, uh, because it's almost like Solana has become the, the mechanism for, all, for this casino to operate on. Right. And if you look at the price of Solana, the price of Solana has gone from $17 in 2023 to $184, and it's been as high as $200 quite recently. So... I mean, yes, you know, it's like the meme coin trading is very much like a game. It's a really, really, really fun game to play. Trust me, I was very skeptical. I was like, guys, why are we wasting our time on meme coins? But it's actually quite cool to place your bets on what you think meme culture is going to be. And if you're right, to be able to sell the top and buy the bottom. It's a game. It's a casino. You just realize that it's a game. And this game is all built on a blockchain called Solana, or most of it's built on a blockchain called Solana. 
And as a result, every time you trade the token, Solana makes the fees. And so Solana is like the, becoming very quickly the number two blockchain in the world. Like Ethereum is the number two, but Solana is very quickly catching up. I think you even tweeted this yourself. I just saw, like, is this a market top signal? All of this that's happening right now? There is for us. Um, is it a market top signal? I don't think it's the top of the market, but I do think that there is a lot of frost. By the and way, Pepe, uh, with the other stuff you showed me, everything, Ethereum even, everything spiked in the last four weeks. I mean, it, the Bitcoin ETF was approved in, in January, so it can't be that. So what, what, what happened in the last four weeks? Think about investor psyche. First, Bitcoin recovers. Then the other major technological chains, Solana, Ethereum, start to recover. And then people start looking for more risk. So, you know, first you take Bitcoin risk. Once you realize that the risk return profile of Bitcoin doesn't make sense, you move down the, you move up the risk spectrum and down the, the, the value spectrum to Ethereum and all the other ones. Until eventually you get to a point where you say, hold on a second, I'm willing to take ridiculous risk to make ridiculous returns. Um, I'll, I'll give you some examples of, of of things that are happening in my office. Yeah, I have a bunch of I have a bunch of employees and researchers. Some of them earn you know three, four, five, six thousand, seven thousand dollars a month, and they've been great researchers. Now these guys have gone and put a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars into a meme coin. The meme coins do a thousand x, two thousand x sometimes. That, that that's how quickly these meme coins move overnight. The biggest problem I have at the moment is retaining my staff because a guy who's earning $5,000 a month who put $1,000 into a meme coin, he made 1,000 X. Yeah. And they do, they do 1,000 X. He's got, he's got a million dollars now. How do I get that guy to come to work to earn his $5,000 salary? It's almost impossible. And that's actually the biggest problem that I'm facing in my business. Oh man. Everyone around me here, everyone around me, there's 65 of us here in the business is making millions, uh, literally I'm telling you millions of dollars on meme coins. And I, to be honest, I've lost complete control of my business because you, you know, you think about salary as a remuneration for paying people for the value that they add to your business. And it's all cool, but you know, if they make, if they've just made 200 times their, their salary, their job becomes, unless this place can be fun or so much fun, they would rather sit at home and trade meme coins. And that's right now the biggest problem that I'm having in my business is that my top researchers have made so much money on meme coins that they, they don't need to come to work anymore. I mean, even one of my co-founders, this is a guy that was make that was making you know reasonable money investing in Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Phantom, and all the other blockchains. The guy's made so much money on dog worth hat. He bought dog worth hat at like two cents. Okay. And he put a couple of thousand dollars, probably $10,000 in dog worth at two cents. Seeing his dog worth hat went to $3. Okay. That's 150X on say $10,000. Guy doesn't feel like coming to work anymore. Okay. So at one point I resisted these meme coins a lot. And I said, you know what? I'm going to stick to my fundamental investing until eventually I realized that if you just take 1% of your portfolio and yeah. you put it in the casino, you know, and to be honest this month, I've made way more money in meme coins than I've made in anything else. Now, do I consider that an investment? It's not an investment. It's a casino. It's a lot of fun to play. And Dave, I urge you to maybe speculate on one or two meme coins just for shits and giggles. It's a lot of fun to play. Um, but it, I mean, as long as you don't let it detract from your, you know, your real investment thesis, as long as you can have the, the mind power to say, that's fun. That's that's work, and the two don't meet. <laughs> I'm not going to advise my viewers to go follow meme coins, but I would like to ask you how you follow meme coins. Is there like you Reddit? Is there like Twitch? Like how do you how how, how does one wake up and be like, okay, you know what? I'm going to buy dog with a hat today. Like how do you how do you obtain that information? Is it is it your friends on Discord just messaging you? Like what what's going on? So you know, there's like a whole lot of. So the first thing is you got to like. You, you got to get into the mindset of meme coins. And the mindset of meme coins, <laughs> as you guys think, is what is what is going to catch on, and when is it going to catch on? I'll give you an example. Like yeah, right please. now, a lot of people looking for a Sam Bankman-Fried meme coin, like different kinds of Sam Bankman-Fried meme coins. Why? Because they know he's going to get sentenced, and they re they realize they reckon when he gets sentenced, he'll be topical, and people want to speculate on it. Let me give another one. There's the elections coming up. Uh, very soon. I want to show you something very fucking cool. Uh, so, 
I mean, this is all real stuff that I'm showing you. Like, and I, and I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm quite surprised that, that our conversation's gone this way, but since it's here, let's enjoy it. So there's the, the US elections coming soon, and there are two tokens that are absolutely, absolutely huge where people have made tons and tons and tons of cash. The first one is a token called um, Trump. So it's, it's, let me just see if I can find a better, a better uh, depiction of it. Hold on, MAGA. Hold on one second. Let me just get us a better, a better website here. Yeah. Um, so it's called Big Screener. It's called so, so. There are two tokens which are battling it out. The first token is Trump, which is which is you know you can almost say the Trump token. Okay. The the, the token symbol is MAGA. The fully diluted valuation of that token, the market cap, is two hundred and ten million dollars. And then you know crypto people don't like Joe Biden at all. They call him Bowden. Okay, they call him Bowden. So that's Bowden. Bowden has a market cap of $89 million. And so you see what, what these guys are doing is they've created. You ask me, how do you how do you find these things? So that's the depiction of Joe Biden. Uh, you know, and 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 you know, I'll show you the, the Trump, the 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 Trump depiction, um, the MAGA depiction, make him make him make it great again. Let's just quickly go there. So this is the 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 depiction of of uh trump or maga uh hold on there we go so you see they've they've made trump like much more serious the obvious you can see that they like trump a lot more right than they gonna, like i was trump. just gonna guess that yeah Joe, now every now every time trump wins a debate every time trump does something amazing the market cap of this goes up every time he loses something he, it goes down and so People are betting on sentiment. So you ask me, how do you identify these things? You've got to be plugged into cool sentiment. Yeah. So I follow a lot of people on Twitter. Um, we have meme shows once or twice a week where I actually bring in these people that, you know, ordinarily you would never allow on a respectable uh, investment channel. But you know what? These guys, uh, they, they are deeply tapped into meme culture. And right now there's a thing called the meme coin casino, which is happening. And listen, I know it's absurd, but... You could say that this is the equivalent of our DraftKings or our Vegas casinos or Caesars Palace, which are actually really big business. Ours is just happening in a virtual way, trading blockchain tokens. And it's a lot more fun. And I don't have to travel all the way to Vegas to play it. You know, this it, is much more fun than online poker. This is much more fun than online slot machines. <laughs> Betting on meme culture is, it's a lot of fun. I just, I can't explain to you how much fun it is. It, and it, again, up yeah. until about a month ago, I was like, guys, I'm not playing this meme coin thing. I'm much more focused on on fundamental investments. But then I realized it can it can be a lot of fun. You can make a lot of money with a, with a relatively little bit of money, right? And it gets you plugged into into culture. I I, I get the logic. You put a thousand dollars and you lose a thousand dollars. So what? But the upside is you can one thousand exit. Yeah, I yeah I I, I get that logic. I, I tried that before. Um, for me, it didn't work. But you know what? People are watching this right now, and they're probably thinking, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> you know what? The, the, the St. Louis Fed quits rate, okay? That's a contra indicator to the market because it peaked in 2021 and now fewer people are quitting. The quit rate was 3% of the total non farm payroll uh, workforce. Now it's 2.1%, right? It's been coming down. As soon as it starts going up because everybody, like, you know, like the people you work with are quitting their jobs because they're all meme coin millionaires, that's when we know there's a market top. We're not, we're not there. We're not anywhere near there yet in, in the crypto cycle. I'm just checking. Yeah, we're, we're nowhere near there in the crypto cycle. We really, really, really aren't anywhere near there. We are far from that. We're in the beginning of the bull market. There is a little bit of frost like there is every cycle, but it's just the beginning of the bull market. Uh, final question. I'll let you go. AI based cryptos. They're seeing a, uh, they're seeing a surge, right? Things like I think you've shown uh, render, right? That was on your bubble. Uh, Bits and Soar, Singularity Net. Uh, just to name a few, they've all been seeing double-digit returns. It's all on the back of AI and uh, the uh, NVIDIA chips that they've uh, that are hitting the headlines. Um, are you following this space? So I want to show you again. You just go to the banter bubbles. You go to the full. How do we access that? By the way, that's very cool. That's a very cool tool. How do it's we get banter, that? Banter bubbles. Banterbubbles.com. Okay. And you press AI, and this shows you all the AI tokens in the market, and you can you know you can sort them by year, by month, by sorry, you can sort them, you can filter them by year, by month, you know, whatever you want. So I can go all AI, all artificial intelligence tokens, and I want to see their moves in the last year. And now I've got all the moves in the last year. So you can see that there's been 
humongous, humongous, humongous moves here. You've got uh, Nasana up 30,000%. 30, You've got Render up 644%. You've got Ayaz up 2,477%. So you can see there's been major, major, major moves in the AI sector. And this is actually why I love the bubbles. You know, you can really just, you can dive in, you can see all the charts. So let me tell you what I think about this crypto AI narrative. I think the majority of the crypto AI narrative is really just hot air. But I think that as long as mainstream AI continues to be big, crypto will continue to run because that's just the way it is. You know, that when, when, when everything runs, everything runs. However, there is one, one, one pool in crypto AI, which I think is something that might shoot the lights out and it's something that you've got to take very, very, very seriously. And that is in AI, the biggest problem that they have right now, or one of the big problems that they have right now is the fact that they don't have enough GPU power. It just doesn't exist. There's just not enough GPU power. Nvidia can't manufacture enough GPUs. And one of the big limitations is that they just don't have enough computing power to be able to render the large language models that we need. So what most people don't understand is that for AI, you need a lot of computing power to train the AI to be able to give you all these fancy answers that you get. And the biggest limitation that we currently have, we don't have the computing power. So there is a sector in AI, which is distributed computing power. In other words, if you have computing power and I have computing power, and we're not using all of our computing power and we want to rent it to other people to be able to use our computers, we can actually do that in, in a decentralized manner. In other words, what do we mean? If I could say, Dave, do you mind loaning anybody your computers? You keep them, you keep your computers in your, your warehouse, but let other people use them. And as they use them, they get rewarded in, in they reward, they reward you in tokens for using computing power. Now, for you, it's a great deal because you're basically saying, what do you mean I can just leave my computers running and just earn money in terms of tokens? That's a great deal. And not only that, it solves a major problem, which says we don't have enough computing power. The only way that I know that people that don't know each other will, uh, will be able to, to allow uh, um, uh, people to use their computing power is if they get rewarded immediately on a trustless ba in a trustless manner, and that is crypto. And so, for example, Render, Akash, Ayaz, Nasana, which are all the ones that you see on the screen, what they do is they allow people to use redundant, to sell and to, to sell redundant uh, uh, computing power to other people that want to use it to train, to train models and related. And that is a problem that I think that only crypto can solve because in the absence of being able to manufacture more computing power, the only way that I know to solve this is to use distributed computing power. And the only way that I know to, to do that on a trustless basis uh -huh. is through crypto. So I think that can be, for as long as it is going to be a shortage of, of, of GPUs, then I think Akash, Render, Ayaz, Nasana, GPU.net, uh, and all of these will act could actually succeed. So that's the one sector where I'm really, really, really paying attention. Okay, uh, let's finish off on your work. Crypto banter. Lots has been happening in the crypto space. You've been covering a lot of stuff, obviously. I've, I've been watching some of your videos. The biggest macro trade of our lifetime, all in on crypto. That was a fun video to watch. Um, a lot of other good stuff you got on your channel. Well, what, what else is going on in your business? You've got the bu bubbles uh, that came out. Um, are you working on anything else that we should know about? As a business, uh, it, it, you know you know my history. My history was that I built and sold one of the biggest marketing companies in Africa, well, the biggest marketing company in Africa a couple of years ago. And after that, I decided that I wanted to do something with a lot of impact. We built a channel around changing people's lives. And the way that we know how to change people's lives is to help them make money and to become financially free. The reason why that's such an important mission to us is because I know that financial, that if you're not financially free, you're actually in prison. There's a lot of people that work just to eat and sleep. And that's no different from being in prison, except in prison, you don't have to work to eat and sleep. You just, you, you just get free shelter and free accommodation. But otherwise, if you're not financially free, then you're actually in a prison. And what our mission here is, is to take people out of prison. So we have three pillars to do that. One is we have a free crypto school, which anybody can sign up to. Uh, there's a link on all my shows on the YouTube channel. There is a link to the school. Uh, that'll teach people about crypto. It'll teach people how to trade crypto. It's absolutely free. No one has to pay. The second thing is we do daily broadcasts. We have five shows every single day, which are designed to teach people 
how to become financially free. Yes. How do we do that in a very simple way? We don't teach off scripts. We don't have researchers writing a script. We literally learn about crypto all day and teach people and show people exactly what we are doing about it. We trade in uh, with very, very, very transparent accounts. And I just want to show you how transparent our accounts actually are. This is an account that we started with $50,000 in November. Uh, you can see it on your screen now. Uh, today, this account has $4.1 million worth of assets. Well, is this real money? Every single trade, real money. Every single trade that we've taken has been taken live on the, on the screen with our community. No, no bullshit, no, nothing to hide. We literally show every single trade live so that there's no, oh, well, you guys are taking off. It's all real money. It started at $50,000 around October. It's been as high as $5 million. It's now sitting at $4 million. We literally show this every single day, five shows every single day on the channel. And then the last thing that we do is we have free software products that we provide our community to help, to help make them rich. One of them is Banter Bubbles. This is Banter Bubbles. You've seen it. The cool thing about Banter Bubbles is not, I mean, it's great that you can see all the, all the, all the moves and you can see in the last hour, crypto's um, really exploded. But in every bubble, there's a chart. And in every chart, the community uh, meet and they actually chat. So you can actually see, so you can see, hey, the bubbles, the price is going up. Why is the price going up? Let me go and see what the community are saying about it. And there's usually a chat and the chats are usually quite vibrant and active. But more than that, we have 40 researchers that work at Banter. And our entire newsroom is given free to the community in the on the website. Uh -huh. So basically, where I get all my information, all this is the, this is all my research that I'm using. It's free to our community on our website. So we're really serious about making people rich and changing people's lives by making people rich. Um, we're really, I mean, as you can see, we're really, really, really serious about it. Um, and yeah, you asked what's happening at Banter. Well, hopefully we just continue to change people's lives by making them rich. All right. Uh, that's what we come to every single day. Okay, let's put the, uh, we'll put the link to uh, your website and your channel down in the description below. Appreciate it, Ron. Always good to talk to you. Very informative as always. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Dave. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you as well. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow Ron Neuner and Crypto Banter in the links down below.